Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Manu Karaga, and this is a webinar on EMS Nambudripad, A Revolutionary Life. This event is being co-sponsored by the People's Forum, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, Leftward Books, and 1804 Books. And um, before I say anything else, I want to pass it over to Sidanva Deshpande from Leftward Books. Hello and welcome. My name is Sudhanva Deshpande. I'm an editor at Left Word Books, which is a New Delhi-based publishing house. Um, we are very pleased to partner with Tricontinental Institute and 1804 Books in New York to, um, to host this event uh, on the life and legacy of EMS Nambutripad. Comrade EMS Nambutripad was born in 1909 and he died in 1998 at the grand old age of 89. And it's been nearly a quarter century since he passed. But this quarter century has not diminished his importance. He was a leader of the communist movement in India. He was a former chief minister of Kerala. He was a founder member of the Communist Party of India, Marxist. He was a prolific writer whose insights on Marxist theory, the international court, women's struggles, and national liberation, as well as the strategy and tactics of the Indian Revolution continue to shape theoretical debates and practical activity in our day. This presentation will introduce his life in its historical and political context. Let me just end this uh, short introduction with a favorite story of mine, which might well be an apocryphal story, but it bears um, retelling because of what it says about Comrade EMS. It is well known that Comrade EMS summered. Um, and there's this story about uh, an American journalist, obviously a cocky man, who asked him in a press conference, Comrade, do you always stammer? And Comrade EMS Nambutripad said, No, only when I speak. That was Comrade EMS. I don't know if the story is too true or apocryphal. But certainly it sums up the man. He was a man of tremendous wit. He was a man of quick repartee. He was a sharp thinker. And he was a man of action. With this, I hand it over to 1804 to continue the event. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So once again, I'm Manu Karuga. I'm a co-editor of 1804 Books alongside Leanne Fullahan. Um, 1804 Books is a bookstore and a publishing project that's based out of the People's Forum in New York City. It's the North American distributor for Leftward Books. And I wanna point you your attention to the recent Leftward edition of Gramsci's Thought by EMS Nambudripad and P. Govinda Pillai. Um, this is a new English translation of the original book, which uh, was written in Malayalam. And EMS wrote this at the very end of his life, towards the end of his life. And the book provides a window into the life and work of Gramsci from the perspective of a leading practitioner of the Marxist method in India. And I think it, um, you know, there's a lot of wealth in this book for those who are new to Gramsci and those who've been studying Gramsci for a, a long time. So I Highly recommend this book, Gramsci's Thought. As a publishing project, 1804 Books is producing text for political education. Our latest publication, which is a joint publication with Leftward Books, is Comrade of the Revolution, Selected Speeches of Fidel Castro, um, which is edited by Manolo de los Santos and Vijay Prashad. Today's presentation on the life of EMS Nambudripad was prepared by an international group of researchers who studied EMS over the course of several months as part of a course on national liberation Marxism, which was hosted by the Tricontinental, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. And the group is made of Kolia Abramsky, Anwish Bhattacharya, Surangi Akar, Anna Maldonado, Kambali Musavuli, Luleki Mevalase, 
Priyanka and myself, Manu Karaga. So we work together to prepare this presentation, which we'll screen now. And after the presentation, we'll have uh, some time for a period of, of uh, questions for discussion. So, uh, and um, before I go forward too, I wanna, I'll say this again after, during the discussion period, for those who are interested in learning more about Kerala in particular, I wanna um, point your attention to a previous event hosted by the People's Forum, which is called People's Planning, Kerala Local Democracy and Development, um, which was also um, responding to a book from Leftward Books. And uh, that event features the authors of that book, Thomas, Thomas Isaac and Richard Frankie, and it was moderated by Subin Dennis. You can find it on the YouTube channel for the People's Forum. Okay, thanks. Elam Kurlam, Manakkal Sankaran Nambudiripad, popularly known by his initials EMS, was a leader in the application and development of Marxism in India. He was one of the founding members of the communist movement in Kerala, a state in southern India in the 1930s. In 1957, he would lead the Communist Party of India to victory in Kerala's first state elections, one of the world's earliest electoral victories for the communist movement. In 1964, he was instrumental in establishing the Communist Party of India Marxist, which is now India's largest party of the left. His work in the movement spanned more than 60 years. In the early 1930s, he belonged to the Congress Socialist Party. Later in that decade, he helped build the Communist Party of India. He would play a leadership role in the undivided CPI and then in the CPIM until his death in 1998. He steered the communist movement in India through periods of major political divisions at the international and national levels, coming out of these divisions politically intact. He demonstrated a rare ability to read the class forces at play. The state of Kerala itself, which combined three states that had been separate under British rule is itself the result of EMS's practical and theoretical work. A polymath, EMS's career spanned different phases of political struggle, from clandestine work in banned political movements to serving as the chief minister. His writings as a Marxist theorist encompassed history, art, literature, political economy, and linguistics. A specialist in Malayalam, the most widely spoken language in Kerala, he translated numerous works of revolutionaries from other countries into Malayalam. EMS had had a long lasting influence and rich legacy, particularly in shaping and politically unifying the state of Kerala in post-independence India. Early life, EMS is almost seven decades as a leader in India's communist movement was shaped during his childhood years. He was born on June 13, 1909 in Parinthalamana, a town in Malabar district, which is now part of Kerala, a state in southern India. At the time of his birth, Malabar was under British colonial rule as part of Madras presidency. EMS was the younger son of a Namudri family. Namudris were located at the apex of Malabar's caste hierarchy. Caste developed over generations as a graded system of social hierarchy. Different castes traditionally maintain different professions. Caste is associated with ritual purity and cleanliness, with those lowest on the caste hierarchy treated as untouchables by those higher on the hierarchy. Pre-independence Kerala was notorious for its extreme development of the caste system. At least one caste in Kerala was considered to pollute others just by being seen. EMS was born into the society in a position of ritual privilege. Caste, EMS explained in his book, Kerala Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow, constituted a primitive form of class division. In Kerala, the Namudri and Nair caste controlled most of Kerala's land. These groups were supplemented by non-caste Hindus in the role of laborers and peasants. In Kerala, unlike elsewhere in southern Asia, there was no development of merchant caste. This role, EMS argued, was filled by some Jews, Christians and Muslims. The later two communities 
also filled the roles of laborers, peasants, and artisans. Landed property lent a certain instability to feudal Kerala. Around AD 400 to 430, EMS explained the rulers of Kerala arrived at a militarist feudal state rooted in private property and land closely linked with the caste system. Over time, the militarist feudal system began to break down due to factional fights among the rulers. In this process, EMS located the origins of development of a distinct nationality in Kerala, emerging out of the various caste and religious communities. This process helped unify the various dialects into a single national language, Malayalam. EMS identified the 16th and 17th century as a formative period of a national literature in Malayalam alongside the formation of a national culture in Kerala. EMS identified the formation of a national market in agriculture products, attracting Arab and European traders. A few feudal families centralized power through a system of ruthless terror against the feudal opponents. A process of national unification that was taking place in the Iberian Peninsula during the same period. The Portuguese who arrived in Kerala in 1498, representatives of a class in motion back home, forged a trading role for themselves in Kerala while representing an external social order. Portuguese and later Dutch and English strategy played the ro- local rulers against each other to carve out monopolies over cash crops such as black pepper. EMS provided a materialist analysis of a historical emergence and development of caste and communal society in Kerala. Engaging Engels' work on the origins of family, private property and state, EMS analyzed the influence of Nair and Namudri family structures on property relations in Kerala. In the rational movement in Kerala, he argued, had to confront caste, gender and class power in order to establish genuine democracy. The Freedom Struggle According to EMS, the first form of the modern democratic movement in Kerala was the mass movement for the abolition of caste restrictions. This emerged in the last quarter of the 19th century. Azawas were the largest and most organized caste among the non-caste Hindus. They engaged in a struggle against so-called untouchability. These kind of agitations against caste oppression and organizing through caste-based associations, this would later provide a foundation for the emergence of peasant organizations. As Emes wrote, the thirst for basic transformations in the social system was reflected in the field of culture. Anuzawa leader innovated modern lyric poetry in Malayalam. Malayalam grammar, rhetoric, and linguistic science developed out of the ferment of these years. Emes found that the literary associations and activities of the early years of the 20th century, the caste associations, the tenancy movement, these were the beginnings of a new form of united action of the immense majority of the people for the benefit not of a small minority but of the entire nation. While in his teens, EMS became involved in the Yogakshima Sabha. This was the main Namudri organization for social reform. Namudri was the caste that EMS belonged to. He campaigned for women's rights in education and marriage. His intention, he would say, was to change Namudris into human beings. By the 1920s, a capitalist class had begun to emerge in Kerala. Its primary field for investment was land since expansion in other areas was restricted by colonial monopolies. EMS argued that British rule involved the transformation of the landowners from a real ruling class to a class of rent-receiver parasites in every sense of the term. The years 1920 to 1921 saw a political upsurge among Muslim peasants in Malabar who were known as Mopalas. This is remembered as the Malabar uprising. The Muslim peasantry resisted imperialism and feudalism, and this made it extremely unlikely that they would confine their politics within the limits of non-violence laid down by the bourgeois leadership of the national movement as it then existed. As EMS noted, it was not for a non-violent, non-cooperation movement, but for real militant action of the masses that the Mopala peasantry was being organized by the local and middle leadership. The peasantry was so well organized that the British army needed six months to regain control. In the meantime, the leaders of the rebellion established what EMS assessed as a real people's government in their areas of control. EMS concluded that the uprising showed that the Mopla peasants when roused to action were resourceful enough to devise ways and means of fighting an enemy superior in every, every respect 
except in that of people support. These factors together form in EMS's analysis a real national democratic movement. The movement combined the struggle of peasants against landlord exploitation, the struggle for national unity among Malayalam speakers, the mass movement against caste oppression, and the movement for a modern, progressive culture. In Kerala, the struggle for democracy began as a struggle for social equality for all castes, and from there, it developed to a struggle for political and economic democracy. The Malabar Uprising also demonstrated the distinct class interests at play in the anti-imperialist struggle. The bourgeois leadership of the Congress, the organizational center of the Indian nationalist movement, which was then under Gandhi's leadership, they panicked at this militant attack on feudal privileges. The Indian capitalist class, which was seeking to establish its own control over the Indian economy, they drew a primary alliance with rural landlords who maintained their grip on village life through appeals to caste and religion. EMS argued that instead of trying to learn the art of revolutionary resistance from the peasantry, the Congress leaders tried to teach the peasants the art of non-violent surrender. According to AMS, such an anti-democratic leadership of the Congress was bound at some stage or other to come into clash with the Mopala peasants that were roused to activity in Malabar in 1920-21. For they were unlike the leadership, anti-imperialist and anti-feudal in the real and full sense of the term. The overwhelming majority of them were landless peasants. They demanded major changes in the land system, including substantial reductions in rent. The opposing class interests of the Congress leadership and the peasantry would intensify over the course of the freedom struggle. In 1929, EMS enrolled in St. Thomas College in Thrissur, Kerala, where he became involved with the Indian National Congress. Within two years, he would leave college to join the civil disobedience movement. In Kodikor, in his early 20s, he engaged in civil disobedience and was sentenced to three years in prison, but was eventually released after 19 months. While in prison, he shared food with lower caste people, for which the Nambudri community decreed him an outcast. In what might be considered an act of caste suicide, he later refused to perform ceremonial penance to return into the caste. In Kannur Central Prison, EMS and other young radicals established contact with militant revolutionaries from other parts of India, and a new world of left-wing politics opened up before them. After he became involved in the Indian National Congress, EMS organized night schools and reading rooms in villages throughout rural Manabar. At these schools, militants took inspiration from Bhagat Singh, the Punjabi revolutionary and student of Lenin, who was executed by the British in 1931. And they also discussed developments in the USSR. These initiatives to raise the cultural and scientific literacy would mark EMS's contributions throughout the rest of his life. Within the Congress party, a distinct group of militants emerged, ideologically outside the sphere of the Gandhian leadership. By the time the Congress leadership abandoned mass civil disobedience, the majority of the Congress rank and file in Kerala had turned to the left. These leftist congressmen, EMS would later write, declared themselves socialists and organized the Congress Socialist Party. In 1934, along with P. Krishnapillai, A.K. Gopalan, K. Damodaran, and others, EMS joined the Congress Socialist Party. He was elected its joint secretary and formed its Kerala unit. The CSP was a socialist group within the Indian National Congress. Meanwhile, anti-imperialist politics was suffusing the caste organizations in Kerala, leading to an ideological revolution within their ranks. Rationalism, atheism, materialism, and through these, sympathy for the land of communism. In EMS's words, this was the process through which the radical rank and file of the caste organizations came to accept socialism at the same time as rank and file congressmen were groping towards it through their own political experience. The left wing was strengthening within Congress and also within caste organizations. 
these two groups began to converge in the next phase of Kerala's freedom struggle. During these years, the industrial working class emerged as a significant part of Kerala's political arena. In 1934 to 1935, there were a series of industrial strikes, which included Koar workers and teachers in Kananur, Calicut, Ferrot, Thrissur, Cochin, and Aleppi. For the first time in the history of Malabar, trade unions were organized in all of the industrial towns. Sectoral struggles quickly developed into a wider process of working class organization, leading to the formation of the All Kerala Trade Union Congress in the May of 1935. As Joint Secretary of the South Indian Federation of Peasants and Agricultural Labor, EMS helped form the All India Kisan Sabha, All India Peasants Union, in 1936, following the first All Kerala Conference of Trade Unions the year before. These organizations provided a worker-peasant mass base to the freedom struggle. They linked the struggle against feudalism and feudal landlords within India to the struggle against British imperialism. In 1937, alongside P. Krishna Pillai and A.K. Gopalan, EMS was one of the five members who formed the Communist Party of India, the CPI in Kerala, in a clandestine meeting in Calicut. EMS formally joined the CPI in 1938 while continuing to serve as the General Secretary of the Kerala Pradesh Congress Committee and the General Secretary of the Congress Socialist Party in Kerala. He demonstrated his political leadership by convincing the entire Kerala unit of the Congress Socialist Party to join the Communist Party. An alliance between socialist-led congressmen and nationalist Muslims brought the peasants and teachers' movements into the Muslim-majority areas of Malabar. During 1938 to 1939, Peasants withheld payment of rent, employing a social boycott against the landlords and their allies. In Aleppi, the working class engaged in major public rallies with militant workers' resistance against police violence. Krishna Pillai led the strike organization. Students from elementary school to college demonstrated all over Travancore. Peasants prepared themselves to resist military force, cutting telegraph lines. Some of the peasant leaders were later executed. The first state executions since the 1921 Malabar uprising. In 1939, while serving on Madras Provincial Legislative Assembly, EMS carefully researched land tenancy in Malabar, submitting a note of dissent to the Malabar Tenancy Bill. His findings would form the basis of land reforms implemented by the communist government in Kerala under his leadership in the 1950s. In 1940, following an escalation of anti-communist cases in British colonial courts, EMS went underground, living for the next several years among poor peasants, farm workers, and fish workers. Decades later, he would remark on the lessons he learned from his hosts during these years. The ban on the Communist Party was withdrawn in 1942 following the British-Soviet alliance in the war against the Nazis. And the first Congress of the Communist Party of India was held in 1943. EMS was elected to the party's Central Committee, and he thereafter remained a central figure in Indian politics at the national level. During World War II, the main wings of the Indian freedom struggle sought advantage from British weakness. The Congress Party launched the Quit India movement while the Indian National Army, which had been formed by the Bengali revolutionary Subhash Chandra Bose, sought the assistance of imperialist Japan to overthrow British power. After the 1941 Nazi invasion of the USSR, the Communist Party in Kerala found itself alone in advocating for participation in the war as a people's war to defeat fascism. Practically speaking, this meant that during the war, the communists in India allied with the British struggle against fascism. In its first major political conflict with the bourgeois leadership of the national movement, EMS noted the Communist Party took its international and class tasks as, as the axis of its political activity. 
EMS would later remark that it required a tremendous amount of political conviction and courage to swim against the current of national sentiment and openly take the international task as the main task. Although isolated politically, the communists continued to develop roots among the rural and urban masses, organizing around daily life questions such as food, clothing and fuel. The party also organized food committees in a state where most agriculture was dedicated to exports. It was precisely during the 1942 to 1945 period that the party developed into a vanguard party with mass membership. The CPI's, uh, the Communist Party of India's weekly newspaper, New Age, rapidly became the most circulated political weekly in Malayalam. When British imperialism weakened after the war, the post-war years proved to be the final years of the struggle against direct foreign rule, where Congress leaders like Nehru argued that the communists were on the other side in 1942, the CPI won a quarter of the vote in Malabar in the 1946 election. These voters, EMS argued, were notable not for their quantity but for the political quality as the vanguard of a new round of mass action. Worker and peasant struggles intensified following this election. In 1946, amidst a post-war strike wave, a South Indian Railway Labour Union general strike drew on solidarity from workers in other industries who helped sustain the strike for a month, winning concessions from the railway ministry. Peasants organized to the, for the right to cultivate fallow lands and retain their own food before paying taxes. On the other hand, princely secessionist movements in Hyderabad and Travancore sought to gain freedom from Britain and also secede from India itself. In his book, Mahatma and the Ism, EMS asked whether India's independence in 1947 should be understood as a triumph or a defeat for the anti-imperialist struggle. EMS interpreted Gandhi as the representative of the Indian bourgeoisie overall, not for any particular faction or sectoral interests. Under imperialism, the bourgeoisie had developed its position through appeals to religious identities as political identities. EMS further said Gandhi was unable to say that violence between religious communities was itself a product of the social forces of imperialism and feudalism. Once the Congress came in power in 1947, it started deteriorating, which reflected its unwillingness to break sharply with the interests of feudal and bourgeois power, interests which were inimical to the further extension of the freedom struggle. Emmett concluded that while Gandhism was triumphant as a political strategy and the tactics of the bourgeoisie in its struggle against the British, Gandhism was a total failure as a new social philosophy. Early independence period. After India attained independence, the Congress leadership proposed a multilingual Kerala. Seeking to maximize their own territorial authority, they drew upon legendary stories about Kerala's origins, rapidly devolving into conflicts between ideas of Aryan or Dravidian supremacy on the basis of caste and religious identities. Ruling class ideologues attempted to marshal science to justify the caste system itself. In 1948, left and democratic forces united against the Congress in the first election in Travancore and Kochi, formerly independent kingdoms which would later become parts of Kerala. In 1952, the Congress party was defeated in national elections. Non-Hindi speaking peoples increasingly demanded states organized on a linguistic cultural basis. Drawing on EMS's early work on linguistic history and grammar, the Communist Party led both of these developments. The Telangana movement from 1948 to 1951 liberated 3,000 villages from feudal landlords. Through an armed peasant movement, a similar movement emerged in Bengal. The CPI withdrew both of these movements following a visit to Moscow, where for the first time the party laid out its program. In this program, the CPI focused on the electoral path, finding the armed struggle could not sustain mass support in India. EMS was elected a member of CPI Politburo in 1953-54. On joining the party units in Delhi in late 1953, he was assigned the responsibility of Kisan Front. Subsequently, he was acting general secretary of the party from 1953 to 56. In the late 1950s, bourgeoisie champions of the United Kerala movement claimed they wanted to restore a previously existing centralized powerful state. EMS argued that such a state was a myth. It had never existed owing to the caste structure and landed property regime. 
Instead, the communists understood United Kerala as a process of national unification arising from the development of unifying and centralized social forces over time, namely the breakdown of the feudal military system. Combining three previously separated states, Malabar, Cochin and Travancore, Kerala was itself the fruition of EMS's calls for a unified state with Malayalam as a common language. The communists were the most organized political force in the new state, having been at the vanguard of the freedom struggle and in the forging of unity at the state level. In 1957, EMS pushed for a united democratic opposition to stand in the election against the Congress party, while continuing to highlight political differences between the communists and the socialists. Key among these differences was the internationalist principle of support for the USSR, a line which the socialists refused to cross. In 1957, Kerala held its first elections, resulting in first communist ministry. This was the second democratically elected communist government in the entire world. Within a week of becoming chief minister, EMS proposed historic land and agrarian reforms. These reforms solidified the rights of tenants and agricultural laborers. Alongside land reforms, his ministry reformed the education system, increased salaries for civil servants and engaged in administrative reforms. The government brought in new private industrial investment while introducing minimum wages and social security. Kerala very rapidly achieved India's highest literacy rate, lowest infant mortality rate and highest life expectancy, which continues today. Many trace the origins of these successes to EMS tenure as the first chief minister of Kerala. Political oppositions united in fierce anti-communist campaign. They blamed the Communist Party for a food crisis that had preceded it and charged the party with corruption for emergency purchases made to alleviate the food crisis. Rural landlords complained bitterly when government ministers met with oppressed caste peasant leaders. Communist ministry placed restriction on police deployments to strikes or farmers protest causing property owners to howl about attacks on their property. A Congress-led United Front of Anti-Communism combined political, social and religious forces which shared nothing in common besides their hatred for the communist government. Efforts to remove the communist government, alleged to have had CIA support, were ultimately successful. Under cover of the so-called liberation movement, Prime Minister Nehru removed the communist ministry from power. The anti-communist front shared no analysis of society and politics, and no common political aims or tactics, beyond the goal of ejecting the communists from power. Once it achieved this objective, it splintered into factional squabbles, severely hobbing the Congress party in the process. Division within the Communist Party also emerged, leading to different tactical approaches. The party's left wing observed the shattering of the anti-communist front that had expelled the party from power and the breakup of Kerala's Congress organization as favorable development. The party's right wing warned that newly emerging groups like the Kerala Congress Party and the possible strengthening of the Muslim League within the Kerala politics posed the greater threats, while the left wing argued for a united front with all socialist and left opposition parties and tactical alliances with the Muslim League, the right wing argued for unity with the Congress party. The divergent reading of the situation spurred a sharp division within the party. While the majority of the party leadership stood on the right, the majority of the rank and file agreed with the left. The conflict between these two political approaches, which took place in a wider context of divisions in the international communist movement following Khrushchev's 1956 denunciation of Stalin's, ultimately led to an open split within the party. EMS was a leader in the left tendency within the party and played a leadership role in the Communist Party of India Marxist from its foundation in 1964. Over the next decade, the CPIM painstakingly built a united front of opposition to the Congress Party. Unlike the anti-communist alliance, this united front was reflected in the unity of mass action as well as unity of the ballot. A struggle emerged for civil liberties, for food, for trade unions and peasant demands. In April 1965, war broke out between India and Pakistan. The CPIM called for a peaceful settlement with Pakistan and EMS conducted the peace campaign across India. This stance found the party isolated in a wave of national chauvinism. The CPI went so far as to denounce their former comrades in the CPIM as anti-national, 
threatening the unity of mass action that had developed. When the war ended, however, and the Indian and Pakistani governments met at Tashkent to sign a peace agreement, mass opinion in Kerala vindicated the CPIM line. The party was then in a strong position to lead the opposition to the Congress party. Obstacles to unity coming from the right, the Muslim League and several socialist parties fell away. The coalition won the 1967 elections in Kerala. Following the victory, EMS warned that the room for the new government was limited by the nature of the coalition that brought it to power. Given these constraints, the success of the CPIM in establishing hegemony can be assessed by the unanimous implementation of land reforms, first mooted in the 1957 Communist government. The 1969 Kerala Land Reforms Act finally realized the demands that had driven the Malabar uprising decades before. Neither British imperialism nor the feudal bourgeois alliance in the Congress party had been willing or capable of fulfilling these demands. Another crucial split emerged after 1967 within the CPIM in the form of the Indian Maoist movement. This split developed in the context of the Sino-Soviet split. EMS characterized the split as a result of revolutionary impatience. The Indian Communist movement assessed the earlier armed struggles in Telangana and elsewhere, finding that conditions for an armed struggle did not exist in the country. As Peace and the Raya wrote, these armed peasants' struggles were isolated ones. In 1965, EMS wrote, our program makes a serious estimation of the possibilities of using the parliamentary institutions to bring governments of a transitional character into existence. A section of the CPIM dis disagreed with this analysis. The beginnings of the Maoist movement in the village of Naxalbari were rooted in the idea of land to the tiller, which was largely in line with the CPIM's policy of land reform. However, faced with police violence, Naxal leaders resorted to arming the peasantry, marking the Naxalite movement's departure from the CPIM. Against the formula of the Battle of Gun, EMS emphasized the painstaking ideological and political work which is necessary for building the revolutionary party of the working class and for forging the unity of all anti-imperialist and anti-feudal classes. For most of the 1970s, EMS led the opposition in Kerala. From 1979 to 1992, EMS served the CPIM as its general secretary. His tenure was marked by the emergency from 1975 to 1977, when Indira Gandhi, the prime minister of India at that time, suspended democracy in the country, followed by the period of liberalization beginning in 1991, with its repudiation of the Nehruvian planning model. This in turn provided a context for the rise of the BJP to one of the two largest national parties. During these years, EMS maintained his critique of caste oppression and insisted on the independent cross-class organization of farmers and women, as he had done from the beginning of his political life. These, he insisted, were the more powerful ways to combat the rise of religiously oriented politics, which betrayed the freedom struggle for the narrow and selfish interests of Indian capitalists. In these years, the socialist project suffered worldwide setbacks with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the rise of the neoliberal agenda, and the decline of the non-aligned movement. In an era marked by the rise of international finance capital, wide-ranging imperialist wars, and politics organized around reactionary social mode, a major feature of political reality in Kerala today is that the left has been successful in making many parts of its agenda part of the broad social consensus. Throughout this process, EMS maintained a critical perspective on politics in Kerala. In his view, the concentration on development in the social sectors of Kerala's economy had led to something of an impasse, characterized above all by a contemporary crisis in the spheres of employment and material production. EMS had no patience with scholars who attempted to romanticize a Kerala model of development. For him, the very high rates of unemployment in Kerala and the low rate of economic growth were politically and socially unviable. 
He saw the task of transforming the conditions and levels of production in Kerala's economy as among the urgent items on the left agenda. Constraints on the authority of state governments in India to set taxes have limited the ability of left governments at the state level to implement transformative policies. EMS proposals, drawing on his experience as chief minister, sought to navigate this situation. Towards the end of his life, EMS insisted that Kerala needed to further develop its productive base and could not rest solely on its great gains in education and life expectancy. People's consciousness in Kerala, he continued, focused on the social service sector with insufficient attention to the productive sector, particularly agriculture and industry. The so-called Kerala model of development made Kerala dependent on other Indian states to meet its basic food requirements, despite the fact that Kerala's land base and resources would allow it to produce enough for export if it reorganized its resources towards internal development. This, he wrote, would require a complete re-education of the mass mind, educating the masses on the crucial importance of increasing production and productivity. Towards the end of his life, he advocated what he called democratic decentralization in order to draw in widespread participation at the local level. The Kerala state government incorporated these ideas in the 1996 People's Campaign for the Ninth Plan. EMS headed the guidance committee for this plan. It required a great deal of organizational work to coordinate and train researchers down to the local village level. The documents produced in the campaign, EMS would write, are such that one would wonder whether the work was done by postgraduates or research scholars. This coordination allowed for the state development plan to be formulated on the basis of the panchayats or village councils and the urban bodies, which are the basic units of a decentralized democracy. The social revolution. Over the course of his political life, EMS insisted on organizing for caste and gender liberation in addition to liberation from class domination and imperialism. For example, while working at the party center in 1954, he set out broad outlines on women's organization. It should encompass all sections of women belonging to different classes on the basis of sheer gender oppression. At the same time, women coming from working class and peasantry would need to constitute the bulk of the membership as they suffer from both class and social oppression. EMS employed the historical and dialectical materialist method to explore and explain the historical emergence of the caste system in India. He wrote about the development of the first class division in India in the form of the four Varnas, the ancient caste division between priests, administrators, merchants and laborers which entitled a division between intellectual and physical labor. He further explained that when struggle between these divisions developed over Indian history, the upper caste who emerged decisively victorious, leading to a victory of idealist over materialist thought. Elaborating and extending Marx's analysis to the concrete historical conditions of the Indian social relations, he found that this disregard of material reality in Indian society eventually led to the decline of Indian civilization, halting its progress in scientific and cultural thought. Centuries later, this would ease the British conquest of India. In his explanation of the interaction of caste and class, EMS offered a brilliant strategies for overcoming these divisions, emphasizing the role of caste for building unified class struggles. In in his essay, once again on caste and classes, he wrote, We had then and still have to fight a two-front battle. Ranged against us on the one hand are those who denounce us for our alleged departure from the principle of nationalism and socialism. Since we are championing sectarian causes like those of the oppressed caste and religious minorities, on the other hand are those who, in the name of defending the oppressed caste masses, in fact, isolate them from the mainstream of the united struggle of the working people, irrespective of caste and communities, and so on. Rather than absorbing caste oppression or religious majoritarianism within class organization, 
EMS sought to use the platform of class organization to attack caste inequalities, religious fundamentalism, and feudal chauvinism. This is clearly visible in his work in Kerala on reservations, land reforms, and the linguistic organizations of the state. The CPIM government in Kerala supported and extended the system of reservations, which is akin to affirmative action, for the so-called backward caste. EMS was against demands for reservations based on economic conditions instead of caste. He argued that caste oppression together with the social, cultural, economic and political consequences of that oppression has not been removed. Furthermore, the fight for land reforms was another method to attack caste. Drawing on survey research, EMS illustrated that upper caste held the largest land holdings while the depressed caste owned the least amount of land. EMS assessed the dangers of idealism in modern times. He wrote that the struggle against Hindu revivalism, which entails strengthening the caste system and Hindu majoritarianism, the struggle against this is essential for the building of a democratic, secular new India. In 1967, EMS had warned that the Congress party was rapidly disintegrating and that no other political party seemed likely in the, in the near future to become powerful enough to form a single party government on the all India scale. At the same time, he noted Congress party officials spread in the window about the volunteer organizations of the CPIM in Kerala, but they remained silent on the fascist RSS and its many front organizations. In the present day, the BJP, which is the political front of the RSS, wields the power to form a single party government, and the Congress party has reached an advanced state of political and organizational decay. Better understanding of EMS's political, organizational, and theoretical work in the last period of his life promises to yield a sharper understanding of the present Indian conjecture. Despite his failing health and age, EMS was actively involved in campaigning for the 1998 Indian general parliamentary elections, soon after which he contracted pneumonia. On 19th March 1998, at the age of 88, EMS passed away in Thiruvananthapuram in Kerala. He was cremated with full state honors. As a leader of Kerala's freedom struggle, EMS launched a decades-long project to transform Kerala's culture and political economy. The success of this project can be seen in the stunning public action during the devastating floods of 2018, and of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic when Kerala has been a shining light in the world. Moreover, the success of the project can be seen in the failure so far of Hindu nationalist forces to establish power in Kerala. When EMS was born, the average life expectancy in Kerala was 25 years for men and 27 years for women. In Malapuram district of Kerala, where his birthplace is located, the current average life expectancy for men is 71 years and 76 years for women. This change is due in no small part to the leadership of EMS Nambudripad. Thank you. So um, we have time for some discussion and questions. Uh, and so please, if you're watching on Zoom, on YouTube, um, if you have questions, you know, please pose those on the chat and we'll read those and, and ask those of our, of our panelists. Um, and we also have a request from uh, one of our panelists. If there's anyone watching who knew EMS personally, if there are any memories that they would like to share, um, you know, this would, of course, enrich uh, all of us uh, in our understanding of, of his great life and, and his, his legacy. I have a few questions to begin um, as we're waiting for those of you who are watching to ask your questions. So I have a few questions to ask of our panelists, um, and I'll turn it over to you. I'll ask, I'll ask three questions to begin, and you can respond to any that, um, that, that speak to you. Um, first, I'd like to, since all of you have spent you know, uh, a number of months now, really carefully and closely 
researching the life and legacy of EMS Nambudripad, I'd like to ask you to share um, any important or significant lessons you feel you've learned from, from this research uh, to, to everyone else, to those who are watching. And second, um, I'd like to ask how your understanding of the work and legacy of EMS speaks to you, kind of helps you understand in maybe any new light or connections that you can make with the political work in your own contexts, uh, the work that you're doing. And lastly, um, how does EMS's life and work help you understand the distinct traditions of national liberation and Marxism? Um, so uh, those are some th three questions to begin with, and we can turn to more. So I see Anna you want has, to first, uh, uh, yeah, Anwesh, go ahead. You've unmuted yourself. Go ahead, please. Right. So I think um, one of the first things that um, one of the key takeaways from uh, studying about EMS, which itself is a great process to learn about uh, a key thinker uh, of Southeast Asia and uh, a very important uh, national liberation Marxist leader is the fact that uh, the conjecture uh, the conjecture in India is uh, very different from other countries, uh, let's say in Europe or Russia. And uh, the important takeaway from EMS's journey is that he very well understood um, which class forces uh, were conflicting. So for example, caste, uh, religion, there are many uh, forces that uh, sort of muddy the struggle uh, uh, against uh, the bourgeois and uh, this he very keenly observed and throughout uh, these 60 years, uh, 70 years after India's independence that uh, the Communist Party of India and the Communist Party of India Marxist has had electoral uh, success, has primarily been in the state of Kerala and uh, partly in another state uh, in West Bengal, which is in the east of India. And this is because of their devotion to these principles of always uh, ensuring that they raise the class consciousness of of the province of, uh, of of the worker peasant mass base and in india uh, you have about uh, india is an agriculture based country and so about uh, i think 60 percent of uh, people are uh, indirectly or directly related to agriculture and so to be able to develop uh, the praxis, the political movement, uh, keeping these things in mind. These were some of the major takeaways from EMS's journey, which we need to um, be aware of in, in, in the future movement. And uh, EMS, for example, wrote highly about on everything. He had columns uh, that he used to write very frequently, uh, monthly columns. And on all these, he gives us the road. He enables us to see how the movement can progress in a country like India, where you need to be able to utilize the democratic, uh, bourgeois democratic structure to advance the movement, to raise class consciousness. And these are some of the key takeaways uh, as a thinker of Marxism, uh, which EMS, I think, gave uh, in the Indian context. Thanks, Anwish. And uh, I see, Anna, you, you're on video, so um, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Manu. Uh, well, uh, I would like to say from the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela that the study of the EMS contribution uh, is very powerful. Uh, EMS uh, contributed to Marxism because he studied the hierarchy and the castes of the Indian society. Um, 
and not only the class contradictions, but uh, gender and, and caste. And in Venezuela, to study and understand our specific form of capitalism is very powerful too, to understand that we are in the middle of a rentier capitalism based on all rev oil revenues. And that developed a specific form of social relations of productions and, and, uh, and this culture that tried to erase our roots, our productive roots, our cultural roots. And also is very powerful that in terms of praxis, in terms of, of praxis and the lessons of a struggle, which is a struggling per permanently, not, not as a single event, but during the course of one's life, as EMS did. Uh, the consciousness also about fulfill the needs of poor people here and now, food, literacy, at the same time, but at the same time, as a good thinker, as a good organizer, as a good dirigent leader, building people's power for the future. Thank you, Anna. That's that's very rich. Um, thanks for sharing um, that perspective on on EMS and how his method and thought travels uh, to struggles happening now at the front lines against imperialism. Um, Coley, I see that you've um, unmuted your video. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, um, I, I think one of the big lessons of studying EMS was on how to think about organizations. He um, he did not have a loyalty to organizations for the sake of organizations. It, as far as I can see, he, he understood organizations as vehicles for particular tasks in struggle. And if that required setting up a new organization, it required setting up a new organization. And I think that's very important that you know organizations are tied to specific tasks. And at the same time, he also stayed with existing organizations if, they, if he felt they were adequate for the task. So in the face of the CPI M and CPI ML split, he very clearly stayed with one side of that split because it was still an organization appropriate to the task. So I think that's, that's very important. And another question linked to the issue of organization is that he clearly favored class, um, in addition to class-based organizations, organ alliances that were cross-class and, and organizations that were also mass organizations. But what I see as very important in that is these were not about lowest common denominator organizations, but were about a struggle for hegemony of working class and peasant leadership over a mass population. So I think that's extremely important that it's totally different from a lowest common denominator form of organization. Another question that again links to this is that he linked the question of history and present and future. So as a historian and an organizer, he, he saw the role of understanding history for shaping current day strategies, for shaping current day tactics, and for shaping current day alliances of the class forces. And only through understanding that history can you understand what the tasks are in a particular moment. So I think that's, that's very important. Something that we didn't have time to really go into in this presentation, but we talked a lot about in our research group last year, was how the struggles that EMS was involved in in India did not take place in isolation from struggles in the world political and economic situation. And in particular, there were certain moments that, that had important lessons for EMS. And I think those, those moments you know, are worth mentioning. Um, I mean, we've heard about some here. We've heard about the early years of the Russian Revolution and also the Second World War. 
But I think other, other moments that are worth mentioning are the divisions that happened between the left and worker organizations in Europe in the interwar years of the 20th century, I think was an important lesson for EMS about the importance of unity and building united fronts. Another vital period we talked a bit, but was the, the Sino-Soviet conflict, and also the question of the division of India and Pakistan and the impact that had on the, the working class in India and obviously in Pakistan. And also later, the question of Chile and how, how um, working class political and economic systems could survive in the face of counter-revolution. I think there were some very important lessons he drew there. And, and I think that's something, you know, we very much have to be aware of in today's struggles, how the national level struggles and the international struggles intersect with each other. And last, I think that clearly the Indian Communist Party, CPIM, is very much an international resource for the movement in the sense that it's been through a hundred years of these struggles. It's outlived the Soviet Union. It's outlived large parts of the socialist bloc. And there's a historical memory there that is obviously extremely important as an international resource now. Polio, thank you. That was a really, really rich extension of, our, of the presentation. Um, it gives us a lot to think about and work with. So um, I wanna to respond to one, two specific questions um, that have been posed in the Q&A on Zoom. Um, one is about the source of, you know, where you can learn more about EMS's critique of Gandhi um, and some of the other uh, arguments that EMS was um, formulating uh, in the 1990s about the inadequacies of the so-called Kerala model and um, his proposals for the, the way forward. You can find both of these sets of uh, arguments in books available through leftward books. Um, one is a, a book that EMS wrote called The Mahatma and the Ism, and that's the title of the book. It's from leftward. And there's another book, which is a collection of essays that he wrote in a regular column for the Indian, the national weekly ma magazine, um, Frontline. And that book is called The Frontline Years. So for those of you who are interested in studying further, a little bit more deeply, um, those two books, uh, The Mahatma and the Ism and, uh, and The Frontline Years. And for those of you who want to, who are wondering about specific details um, from the presentation, uh, the, the, the video of the presentation, the video of the webinar will be available through on YouTube um, in, in a few days. So you can go back and, and find those and check those. So once again, I wanna invite all of you watching on YouTube, on Zoom to ask questions. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left for the event today. And in the meantime, I'll pose a couple more questions that have, that have come up, um, or I'll, I'll repeat one question and um, bring us back maybe to that and then pose another question. And, and the new question is um, to have all of you think about and share with us some of the lessons from EMS's insistence in the Indian situation in Kerala of using um, the bourgeois democratic machinery um, in order to advance the, the movement. And I think we can see this uh, at different points uh, across his life, across his long active life. So that's one question. And uh, the second question is to return back to this larger umbrella of national liberation Marxism and to invite uh, all of you just to respond to National liberation Marxism is a, is a distinct and particular uh, strand in Marxist traditions, um, a, a distinct tradition of thought um, that manifested in, 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 you know, in, in very particular ways across different, different parts of the world that were, that were in, in our fighting imperialism. So are there any of you who'd like to respond uh, to either of those first? Yeah, I'd like to say about the parliamentary democracy. I, th I think he felt that the parliamentary democracy was an arena that needed participating in, but not because socialism could be delivered through it, but 
it played an important role in unifying class forces, unifying working class and peasant forces, and building a further base for struggle. His, his reflections on what happened in Chile very clearly show that he didn't believe that the parliamentary process was strong enough to defend in the face of, of counter-revolution, but without participating, the movement would remain much more fragmented. And yes, uh, I would like to to add that EMS as a minister uh, promote and wrote and launch uh, many initiative of law. Um, it, it like it's particularly in in Cuba. In the first year of the revolution, they in, in Cuba they wrote uh, almost one law by day. At the first year, year they use uh, they they wrote they launched like uh, 30, 300 uh, law in the revolutionary process. Uh, in at the um, uh, in in Kerala, uh, EMS as a minister, he promote he promoted like uh, land reforms, uh, educational and social reforms, and it seems it, it link as that that uh, saying that Lenin Lenin says the the reforms are too important to, to, to let to the reformists. It has to carry out bad revolutionary ones. And EMS had that enormous consciousness about it. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Kolia, for um, for enriching that that aspect of the discussion. I have two comments on the Q and A in the comment panel um, from Subin Dennis um, that I'd like to read, um, just for clarification uh, for everybody who's watching. Um, one is the correct, a small error in the presentation that Subin noticed um, that in the 1952 elections, the Congress Party wasn't defeated, but it won a landslide victory, um, riding on the prestige of having led the freedom struggle. So thanks, Subin, that's, you know, to, for us to correct that. And Subin also has a helpful comment about um, EMS's analysis of caste and policies um, relating to or pushing towards the abolition of caste. And I'll just read his comment. While EMS was strongly in favor of caste-based reservation, he was also one of the first advocates of the so-called creamy layer formula, which entailed bringing an economic criterion to exclude the rich among the other backward classes, backward communities who are above Dalits in the caste hierarchy from reservations. This criterion was later adopted in India as a result of the Supreme Court of India accepting it. EMS was also in favor of providing a small percentage of reservations to the poor among the forward castes and communities. This was also adopted by the Indian Parliament in 2019. The CPIM was in favor of this law in principle, in keeping with the principle that EMS had already laid out, although it had serious criticisms about its concrete details. So thanks, Subin, for the correction, um, very important correction, and also for the, um, the richer context and details on EMS's analysis and proposals around caste and their effects. Um, in at the national scale in India. So we have about 15 minutes left um, and I'll ask, um, you know, there's a couple other questions to me that come to mind really strongly in, in having studied EMS's work um, and that I think actually speak in very particular ways to um, communist movements in other parts of 
the anti-imperialist struggle around the world. Um, and these are, I mean, when we think of the Worker Peasant Alliance, there's something in EMS's long life, which is about the constant renewal of the Worker Peasant Alliance, but also um, land reform, the centrality of land reform and its relationship to the social revolution. So, you know, there was the moment in which he was writing about, um, you know, the left wing of the Congress uh, party moving towards communism. And then, um, you know, the left wing of the caste associations um, also moving towards communi communism and this, this convergence um, from what before had been independent or, you know, organizational at least, organizationally at least independent, somewhat independent movements. So maybe, you know, it's an invitation to all of you to think about and speak to this kind of relationship of uh, land reform or, or struggles over land um, and really struggles um, against feudal land relations in, the, in relationship to the social revolution, which in its way is also a struggle against, um, you know, feudal social relations as they've, as they've persisted or even given new life under imperialism. So would any of you um, like to respond or kind of extend that, that line of the, of the conversation? So I, I think it's um, land reorganization uh, has been a major part of the communist movement throughout India. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, in, in non-independent India, in colonial India, uh, the, the British uh, could uh, capitalize on the fact that India was still a feudal state. Uh, the Indian, uh, the many nations in India were almost all feudal and this was uh, this was capitalized by the british to uh, introduce uh, imperialism in india and keep uh, the, the social uh, productive base from developing uh, and uh, as we have seen later also that most of the uh, revolutions or movements that have emerged have been around land reorganization. For example, the, the Tebhaga movement in West Bengal in the uh, 1950s, the movement in Telangana for land reorganization. And I think this was, I mean, EMS understood this, of course, and uh, the fact that as early as 1940, he had uh, written a note in the Madras Provincial Legislative Assembly about reorganizing land and uh, implementing them when they came to power uh, in 1957 and then again in 60, uh, 57 and then again in 1967. This shows that uh, land reorganization and basically giving land to, to the agricultural workers, to the tillers, land to the tiller. This uh, is necessary to be able to give them the power to change uh, the dynamics of, uh, of uh, agriculture in India and the villages. So. Uh, this is essential for uh, also, and this is where I think uh, the worker peasant mass struggle and the worker peasant base developing the class consciousness um, also emerges um, because uh, without, without land, they are in this cycle of uh, having to serve the feudal uh, system and uh, right now neoliberal capital. And this has been one of his key contributions uh, in being able to uh, legislate and implement land reform in, uh, in a province in India. And uh, subsequently, uh, for example, but where EMS differed was, for example, the Naxal Bari movement, which we talked about in the presentation. So they were also trying to do that, but through, uh, through a militant uh, struggle that uh, was fighting the state and uh, even though it exists in some parts of India right now, it has almost uh, uh, died. I'm not sure if it can resurge, uh, but at this moment, uh, they don't have major uh, they don't have major areas that they control. And so, I think the important thing of knowing what to do and to take the correct strategy 
uh, and the path to achieve those, realize those goals um, in land reorganization, for example. I mean, this has been a key learning lesson uh, for, for the Indian communist movement, I think. Thanks, Sanwish. Anna, did you have anything you wanted to, to add to this, this line of, of questioning? Um, I would like to, to write uh, a quotation of EMS about the Marxist definition, class and caste in criminal lawyer controversy that Subin mentioned. It's very important, uh, EMS says that the real solution to the communal problem rests in the militant unity of the working people that belongs to different caste, religious communities, tribal societies, cultural and linguistic groups. In other words, the class unity of the working people against the exploiting and oppressive groups that were among the elite. And, and he uh, remarks that the, it has to be some um, transformations that address the structural uh, contradiction and, and the structural problem. And is is very powerful all these, the, uh, of, of his uh, analysis, but these distinct distinctions and complementation between class and caste is is very important for uh, all the context, all of of our context. Thanks, Anna. Collier, did you have anything you wanted to add? I'd like to sort of reflect on some of the things that we didn't have a chance to really look into in our work that, that I would have liked to. And that is the question of what were the key commodities that peasant and working class were producing and what the relations were with India to the world economy at that stage. Because I suspect, although we didn't really look into it, that a very key part of the reforms in Kerala that EMS implemented were about changing the relation of Kerala to the world economy and improving Kerala's situation in relation to those global commodity chains and value chains. I, I think that would be an extremely interesting area to look further because it, it seems to me those kind of reforms would have been impossible if they were, if they were functioning within the existing um, structures of power. And equally, those structures of power would have imposed the limits on what would have been possible in Kerala on its own without the rest of India becoming communist. So I think that would be very interesting to, to look at. Okay, great. Well, in the absence of other questions, um, um, maybe I'll just reflect for a couple moments as part of this research group um, of some of the lessons um, uh, that we've taken. Um, and I think there are lessons for, for me in um, better understanding the Marxist method and the application of the Marxist method. Um, and, um, you know, this is something that we can see over the course of, of EMS's life, where he's constantly um, going deeper and explaining um, the application of the method and assessing the situation. Well, again, I want to point to um, the book that was just released by Leftward, which is a, a, a new translation into English of EMS's um, kind of a biography and analysis of Gramsci's life and his methods. Um, and I think for all of us, whether we're new to Gramsci or whether we've been studying Gramsci for a long time, there are lessons from this particular book in thinking about um, Gramsci himself uh, and his method and the Marxist method more broadly 
um, as it insists, like what is necessary in its application in the struggle against imperialism, um, the ongoing struggle against imperialism. Um, and so I, I think it's a very different picture of Gramsci and it's a very different picture of the Marxist method of historical materialism than we would get if we were rooting that perspective in Europe um, with European questions. Um, I think it's a much richer and much more alive. Um, and, um, you know, maybe one thing that comes to mind after listening to all of you um, respond to these prompts and questions is also that another lesson for me from EMS's, from having studied EMS's work with you for some months now, is um, this is a method that um, provides ways to build unity, um, to build mass unity through um, struggles against social oppression. And I think, you know, I'm here in, in New York City in the US and we're, we're in a political situation where um, we have precisely the opposite tendency of uh, addressing forms of social oppression that really splinter and break up um, political unities, um, unities in action. And I think it may be a simple, um, in some sense, it may be a, a, a simple methodological claim or a methodological practice. And it's one that links, you know, in the US, let's say, to um, the long traditions of black communists, anti-racist communists um, here in this country. But again, um, fighting social division, fighting social oppression through the, through the process or through the vehicles of building, of building social unity, of building, especially in particular, building unity of the working class, the independent unity of the working class. So for me, that's a very direct and concrete lesson to take from studying EMS's method um, and EMS's work over his life to a situation um, which on the, on the surface seems very, very far removed from the conditions in which he was living and working. Um, so do any of you wanna have any, any last word um, for, for, for the event here on EMS? I, I think you have summarized uh, more or less uh, what we wanted to say. Um, there is a question on, on the emergence of the right wing, which uh, I just saw. And uh, I, mean, I just wanted to sort of um, spend a minute on saying that EMS uh, had, uh, I mean, the, the emergence of the right wing in India was not sudden, but uh, it was definitely something that uh, does not bode well for the country. And right now uh, there is uh, a right-wing uh, political party in power um, throughout India, except, uh, which is very important, except the state of Kerala. And uh, so the point is that uh, if we can, uh, the way forward, according to MS, is to build uh, the unity, as Manu was also saying, of the working class, and uh, this unity of the working class of the proletariat is, uh, does not have the borders of caste, religion, and other sectarian uh, identities that, for example, these right-wing forces adopt. And EMS uh, has already shown us the way forward. Uh, the point now is to convert it to praxis and to learn uh, how to be able to do that and this is where I think uh, EMS's uh, inspiring life is, uh, is, is uh, a lesson for us to take things forward. Thanks, Anwish. Kolia, Anna, did you have anything? Yes, I, I, I agree that you, you summarized very good uh, the EMS lessons, but also EMS always uh, insists in to occupy, occupy the state, the state as a way to um, take the power and build this people's power to 
um, dominate and, and to rule over the bourgeoisie. It needs to take this consciousness all over the world. And EMS is a very, very way to understand that that needs. Thanks, Anna. I think that may be the perfect note for us to end um, with the organization of the working class to um, assert and control, uh, assert its power over the state and assert its control over society. So thanks for everybody who joined us. Um, I hope this was a rich uh, discussion and presentation and I hope all of you um, continue to study uh, the life and the work of EMS. Um, you can turn to these books from Leftward Press, uh, from sorry, Leftward Books. And um, there are uh, many, many uh, articles, essays you can find um, of, of the work of EMS over the, the many decades of his contributions. So thank you everyone. Please take care and stay well.